In 2008, NASA had an intriguing question. How do spiders construct their webs in zero gravity? Therefore, they sent two spiders to the International Space Station. The first spider was the main participant, while the second served as a backup in case the first one didn't survive. However, things didn't go according to plan. The backup spider managed to escape from its chamber and visited its companion, resulting in a bit of a mess. They built tangled webs that interfered with each other. As if that wasn't enough, the flies that were supposed to be food for the spiders started reproducing faster than anticipated. Their larvae escaped from their container and covered the front window of the chamber. Over time, the spiders were completely hidden behind the larvae. Although this initial experiment didn't go well, one of the researchers involved in planning the spider experiment was still curious. In 2011, she got another opportunity to repeat the same experiment. This time, she sought assistance from other researchers. They decided to send a different species of spider into space and prepared four spiders, two for the ISS and two for Earth, allowing for result comparison. The goal was to expose the spiders to varying gravity conditions and observe their behavior. However, another twist appeared in the story. Initially, they believed they had four female spiders, but it turned out that two of them were actually males. Determining the sex of young spiders can be tricky, but fortunately, one male had already been sent to space while the other remained on Earth, enabling valuable data collection. The second experiment proved successful. The spiders were active. They built and dismantled webs, and even without the assistance of gravity, they spun new ones. Three cameras captured thousands of pictures, showcasing their hard work on the webs. Interestingly, it seemed that spiders created significantly more symmetrical webs in space than on Earth. The center of the webs was closer to the middle, and surprisingly, the spiders didn't always position their heads downward as they typically do on Earth. However, one significant factor made all the difference. Light. When the spiders on the ISS had a source of light, they weaved asymmetrical webs, similar to those found on our home planet. Light played a crucial role in orienting the spiders in space. The chamber's lamps were attached at the top. If the lights had been positioned differently, for example on the side, it would have been challenging to observe the effect of light on the symmetry of webs in zero gravity. When the lights were turned off, the spiders rested in random orientations within their webs. Yet with the lights on, they would orient themselves away from the light source, which meant downward. Hence, in the absence of gravity, light assisted them in orientation. This discovery was unexpected, because spiders can typically build their webs in the dark and capture prey effectively, even without light. Spider's web itself is such a cool thing wherever they are. It's like these creatures have small silk production factories inside them. Within their body, a thread is stored in the form of a highly concentrated liquid. And a regular garden spider can produce up to seven different types of silk, each having a unique combination of proteins. Each type of silk has a different purpose. For example, one type of thread makes the web elastic, which means the web absorbs the impact when insects collide with it. Another type of silk makes the thread flexible and strong, so it's more difficult to break. Some proteins found in the silk protect it from harmful bacteria and fungi, allowing the web to last longer. They also keep the silk moist so it doesn't dry out. Wow, imagine having a home where you don't have to buy anything extra to maintain it. Spider silk is lighter than cotton and incredibly thin, up to a thousand times thinner than human hair. But it's also insanely strong. I mean, it must be since that's what they rely on while living their everyday life. Whether they're preying on some wandering insect or trying to resist heavy rain and wind. But you wouldn't expect it to be stronger than steel, right? Of course, in reality, you don't come across steel that thin. But if you could find a piece with the same weight as spider silk, you'd see that it has similar strength when pulled or stretched. In fact, spider silk is five times stronger than steel of the same thickness. Spider silk is also super stretchy, able to stretch up to four times its original length without breaking. Plus, it remains strong even in freezing temperatures below minus 40 degrees F. The most common type of spider is the orb weaver. They're masters at building those webs you keep seeing in open areas. That's where they have a better chance to catch a tasty lunch. 
But since they choose such spots, their webs are more prone to damage. That's why these spiders have a fascinating habit. They often rebuild their entire webs every day, even if the current web seems perfectly fine. I wish I was this dedicated to maintaining my bedroom. These spiders actually do this because they want to be prepared for the evening when they patiently wait for their potential prey to get caught in their carefully set trap. At first, this might seem like a waste of time. After all, they need to invest a significant amount of protein to produce the silk that forms their webs. But even if an orb weaver spider doesn't catch its meal overnight, it usually has enough silk proteins to dismantle its old web and build a new one for the following night. As the spider removes the old web, it consumes the silk at the same time, and by doing that, recycles the proteins it contains. If you've ever observed a spider on its web, you must have noticed how attentively it responds to even the slightest vibrations. It turns out that spider silk can be finely adjusted to different sound frequencies, unlike any other material. When a spider builds its web, it doesn't just spin the silk and leave it as it is. The spider actually makes adjustments to the silk by changing how tight or loose it is and how different threads are connected. This way, it creates a web that can vibrate or make different kinds of sounds. The spider is like a musician tuning their guitar. This feather-legged lace weaver is called the garden center spider because it mostly enjoys humid greenhouse conditions. And it has a really cool way of catching insects. Instead of spinning sticky webs like other spiders, it uses electricity. It produces incredibly thin silk, almost at the nanoscale. And on its hind legs, this spider has special hairs that act like tiny combs. As the silk emerges from its body, the spider uses these hairs to comb and manipulate the silk. And here's where the magic happens. This process generates an electric charge. The threads of the silk are now crackling with electricity, so they come together to form little poofs that resemble fluffy balls of wool. These electrically charged poofs are a great way to trap innocent insects wandering around. When unsuspecting prey comes into contact with them, the electric charge causes the threads to cling to their bodies, making it almost impossible to get away. Female Darwin's bark spiders make gigantic webs that can stretch over rivers and lakes, which means they can reach over 80 feet across. It turns out such enormous webs are just a part of their genius plan to catch their prey. A super strong web that goes across the water like a bridge can capture large insects that gracefully fly above the water's surface, like dragonflies, and it's an impressive project that takes days to construct. These special lines go across the river and anchor the web firmly to each bank. There's no easy way out of this. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all. Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? If you've watched the movie Alien, then you know the answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut though if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero, when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions. 
like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface, but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first! Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, but something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it, it's completely normal. The truth of the matter is, you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity, NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit, while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse, and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So, you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe, and boil. Yikes! How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads. And we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now imagine living like that for six months, or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill, or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way, their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much. They do need to keep hydrated, though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak or barbecue sauce. Now, as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. 
Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy, and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryo bed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them, and some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sounds somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, 
we didn't know about such things as pulsars, so Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission, the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the Moon, flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the Moon. The side that we never see because the Moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously, and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into soundtracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave 
actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So, let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. Our sun is an average-sized star, and still, it could fit 1,300,000 Earths. The star is also 333,000 times as heavy as our planet. NASA has translated radio waves created by planets' atmospheres into audible sounds. That's how astronomers found out that Neptune sounds like ocean waves. Jupiter, like being underwater. And Saturn's voice resembles background music to a horror movie. Here on Earth, it's bebop jazz. Now I made that up. The sun's surface is scorching hot, but a bolt of lightning is five times hotter. Earth gets struck by 100 lightning bolts every second, which results in 8 million lightning strikes a day and around 3 billion a year. Ooh, shocking! If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there. Because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. Astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bored and wanted to check how things are going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the Cosmic Microwave Background Map, or CMB for short. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. So, you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So, if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some… discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than the Sun. Their event horizon is wide, and the gravity doesn't change as quickly. So, the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen. And since there's not any in space, well… Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40-365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. <laughs> Small comfort. 
When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way, called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine, but space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun, while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side, and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there too, so it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system, the South Pole Aiken Basin. It's as wide as two states of Texas. Yeehaw! One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. Now, the astronauts didn't need them when they left the moon and tossed them when the moonwalk was over. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even tossed the armrests of the seats in the lunar module to reduce the weight. Now, counting all the Apollo lunar missions, the total weight of rubbish on the moon is approximately 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, six lunar modules, and all the experiments left behind. That's like three Boeing 737s. Another myth about the sun is that it's yellow. Let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and it's white. The sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of this spectrum. Oh, one more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa, we're in an asteroid belt, and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid clouds. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon. 
So, there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the dimension of the emptiness in space, look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. Behold the distant future. Yep, humans have successfully colonized Mars and the Moon. Problems with overpopulation and hunger on Earth are solved. But soon, a new threat looms over our planet. Uh, excuse me, planets. And the Moon. Anyway, scientists have figured out that in 150 years, the Sun will explode and destroy our entire solar system. Bummer. There's enough time to build a fleet of huge spaceships and evacuate everyone. But it's not enough time to come up with some sort of sci-fi space jump. It's been a long time since people found a new, potentially livable planet, and the nearest one's a several million years ride away. There's no other choice. Humankind is evacuated into gargantuan spaceships, and the infinitely long voyage begins. A few decades pass. We leave the solar system and watch our sun explode. A huge flash and that's it. There's no more light. Just small, faraway stars and the infinite black depths of space. All ships are on a synced autopilot that won't go off course no matter what. Even if everyone on board were to disappear, the ship would still arrive at its destination. So, the upside, humans will survive for millions more years. The downside? Because of all of that time spent on space transports, we'll look different, totally different. Ships arriving to the new planet will be populated with shapeless, pulsating biomasses sitting inside metal exoskeletons. Here's how it happens. Bones in space get weaker, so do muscles. There's no gravity, so your body's not under any sort of pressure to keep it running properly. Astronauts on the International Space Station do a lot of exercise to stop their muscles from withering away. Ah, back to the story. There are gyms and special machines that recreate gravity on every space transport. But to save energy, they're only plugged in in a couple of hours per day. Unfortunately, no matter how hard people exercise, in space it just won't be enough. After the first hundred years, Human bones have become so brittle that anything remotely physical can lead to injury. After another hundred years, people lose the ability to stand up on their two legs. But it's not only because of weak bones. After all those years in zero gravity, the human body's already changed a lot. A big problem is that people lose their sense of balance. If you try to stand up, you'll just fall. The ship's captains dismantled the gravity machines. They weren't working anyways. And all the sports equipment on board got taken apart ages ago and used as spare parts for the ships. The lack of gravity didn't just make people weaker. It also made them taller. The spine needs gravity to keep it stable. And now all those backbone discs have stretched themselves out. Humans are starting to look like blow-up toys. Everyone's given mechanical arms and legs. You just strap them on and get to work. Servicing the engine, cleaning out the bedrooms, throwing trash out into space, lifting anything. Not happening without those mechanical arms and legs. Time passes, and people become more helpless. Luckily, the mechanical bodysuits keep getting better and better. Since the sun collapsed in on itself, human eyes have been having a hard time. Inside the ships, the sun is replaced by special artificial light that also gives off vitamin D. Since there's way less light overall, people's pupils become wider. Then, after a few more centuries, their vision really starts going downhill. But this problem is solved by technology. Artificial lenses magnify light and keep humans from going completely blind. The ships get disinfected every single day. That stops bacteria and microbes from multiplying. But it also means that the human immune system doesn't have to fight off any diseases. Pretty soon, humans can't defend themselves against anything. Even a mild cold could be seriously harmful. It's fine for now. There are no germs or anything on board. But what's going to happen later on down the road? On the ship, millions of plants grow in special greenhouses with water and ultraviolet light. The plants produce oxygen and spread it through the entire ship. 
Of course, it's not enough oxygen to satisfy millions, but it helps people remember the planet they left behind. After centuries of living on spaceships, humans have adapted to the new conditions and almost stopped breathing. Lungs have disappeared almost completely, and humans are starting to develop other ways of getting oxygen – from water, from liquid oxygen tanks – we're becoming a totally new species. But it's not all bad. Genetic engineering is developing every year. Full-fledged life support suits are created. They help with movement, strength, speed, vision, hearing, even speech. People's voices get so weak they can only speak in whispers. Luckily, the suits have built-in microphones and speakers. There's no food anymore, just specially created liquids. After all that time in space, the human stomach can't digest anything anyway. Fancy a handful of peanuts or a small cracker? Forget it! In the beginning, the special space food had loads of flavor. But over time, people sort of forgot what things were supposed to taste like. Eventually, they stopped adding in flavorings, and because of this new tasteless food, tongue receptors stopped working. Soon, people lost all sense of taste. For some people, this life seems unbearable, but they have a choice. They can just slide on into a cryogenic capsule for millions of years. Then it's just a matter of a quick defrost when the ships finally arrive. But it's seriously risky to be frozen for such a long time. There's no guarantee that the ships won't crash into a huge meteorite, or worse. People start to take a different approach. They upload their consciousness to a central computer. It's safer and requires much less power. And when you wake up, you can just download your mind into a new, modified human suit. Some people decide to stay awake and live a, quote, normal life. Thousands of years pass, then millions. Humans look really different now. All their limbs are now artificial, and the exoskeletons they wear are controlled by mind power. With each passing millennium, arms, neck, legs, and spines, they become smaller and smaller. Brittle bones soon dissolve into nothingness. Eyes, nose, and mouths disappear. The brain isn't protected by a skull anymore, it's just surrounded by soft skin. Only consciousness remains. Nowadays, a human is a powerful high-tech robot ruled over by a small, pulsating bag filled with a brain. It's been a few million years since humans left Earth. All the ship's inhabitants have already forgotten that their species was born on a planet with gravity. The history of life on Earth has become a myth, an ancient legend. Most people believe that these ships are their true homes, always have been. That's why, when humans finally reach their destination, no one's that eager to get off and have a walk around. Life on a new, unknown planet seems like a huge pain in the spacesuit. Gravity, air, bacteria, germs… It takes several thousand years of evolution for humanity to get used to these new conditions. Luckily, humans have a secret weapon – technology. At this point, all humans are downloaded from the central computer into new robot suits. People face a choice – get off the ship and make this planet their new home, or stay and live on the ships. Those that stay on the ships set off into the expanses of space to explore the galaxy and discover new worlds. Those who decide to stay on the new planet have to adapt to the new conditions. It's pretty different from Earth. There's a different air density, different weather patterns, and strange new chemical elements. It will take another million years before these robo-brain sacs take on a new shape. One day, these distant human descendants will want to research their origins. They'll invent a ship that can jump through space and time. The research will lead them to the distant past, to the small planet Earth, to now. This might sound crazy, but just imagine that tomorrow, someone lands in your backyard and they're your descendants from the future. Those passengers who stayed on the ships will probably find new planets and maybe decide to stay on some of them. Their bodies will change and adapt too. So, in billions of years, the universe will be inhabited by different amazing creatures that all have something in common. They were all humans once. <laughs>